Section forty six, chapter seventeen of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackstone. Book One, chapter seventeen. Chapter the seventeenth of Guardian and Ward. The only general private relation now remaining to be discussed is that of guardian and ward which bears very near resemblance to the last, and is plainly derived out of it, the guardian being only a temporary parent, that is, for so long a time as the ward is an infant or under age. In examining this species of relationship, I shall first consider the different kinds of guardians, how they are appointed, and their power and duty, next, the different ages of persons, as defined by the law, and lastly, the privileges and disabilities of an infant, or one under age and subject to guardianship. 1. The guardian with us performs the office of both the tutor and curator of the Roman laws, the former of which had the charge of the maintenance and education of the minor, the latter the care of his fortune, or, according to the language of the court of chancery, the tutor was the committee of the person, the curator the committee of the estate. But this office was frequently united in the civil law, as it always is in our law with regard to minors, though as to lunatics and idiots it is commonly kept distinct. Of the several species of guardians, the first are guardians by nature, viz., the father, and in some cases the mother of the child. For if an estate be left to an infant, the father is by common law the guardian, and must account to his child for the profits. And with regard to daughters, it seems by the construction of the statute, four and five Philip and Mary, c. eight, that the father might, by deed, or will assign a guardian to any woman-child under the age of sixteen, and if none be so assigned, the mother shall, in this case, be guardian. There are also guardians for nurture, which are, of course, the father or mother, till the infant attains the age of fourteen years, and in default of the father or mother, the ordinary usually assigns some discreet person to take care of the infant's personal estate, and to provide for his maintenance and education. Next are guardians and succage, an appellation which will be fully explained in the second book of these commentaries, who are also called guardians by the common law. These take place only when the minor is entitled to some estate and lands, and then, by the common law, the guardianship devolves upon his next of kin, to whom the inheritance cannot possibly descend, as, where the estate descended from his father, in this case his uncle by the mother's side cannot possibly inherit this estate, and therefore shall be the guardian. For the law judges it improper to trust the person of an infant in his hands, who may by possibility become heir to him, that there may be no temptation, nor even suspicion of temptation, for him to abuse his trust. The Roman laws proceeded on a quite contrary principle, committing the care of the minor to him who is the next to succeed to the inheritance, presuming that the next heir would take the best care of an estate, to which he has a prospect of succeeding, and this they boast to be summa providentia. But in the meantime they forget how much it is in the guardian's interest to remove the encumbrance of his pupil's life from the estate, for which he is supposed to have so great a regard. And this affords for Tescue and Sir Edward Coke an ample opportunity for triumph, they affirming that to commit the custody of an infant to him that is next in secession is quasi agnum committere lupo ad deverandum. These guardians and succage, like those for nurture, continue only until the minor is fourteen years of age, for then, in both cases, he is presumed to have discretion, so far as to choose his own guardian. This he may do, unless one be appointed by father, by virtue of the statute 12 Charles II, c. 24, which, considering the imbecility of judgment in children of the age of fourteen, and the abolition of guardianship in chivalry, which lasted till the age of twenty-one, and of which we shall speak hereafter, enacts that any father, under age or a full age, may by deed or will dispose of the custody of his child, either born or unborn, to any person, except a popish recusant, either in possession or reversion, till such child attains the age of one and twenty years. These are called guardians by statute, or testamentary guardians. There are also special guardians by custom of London, and other places, but they are particular exceptions, and do not fall under the general law. The power and reciprocal duty of a guardian and ward are the same, pro tempore, as that of a father and child, 
and therefore I shall not repeat them, but shall only add that the guardian, when the ward comes of age, is bound to give him an account of all that he has transacted on his behalf, and must answer for all losses by his wilful default or negligence. In order, therefore, to prevent disagreeable contests with young gentlemen, it has become a practice for many guardians, of large estates especially, to indemnify themselves by applying to the court of chancery, acting under its direction, and accounting annually before the officers of that court. For the Lord Chancellor is, by right derived from the Crown, the general and supreme guardian of all infants, as well as idiots and lunatics, that is, of all such persons as have not discretion enough to manage their own concerns. In case, therefore, any guardian abuses his trust, the court will check and punish him, nay, sometimes proceed to the removal of him, and appoint another in his stead. 2. Let us next consider the ward, or person within age, for whose assistance and support these guardians are constituted by law, or who it is that is said to be within age. The ages of male and female are different for different purposes. A male at twelve years old may take the oath of allegiance, at fourteen is at years of discretion, and therefore may consent or disagree to marriage, may choose his guardian, and if his discretion be actually proved, may make his testament of his personal estate at seventeen may be an executor, and at twenty-one is in his own disposal, and may alien his lands, goods, and chattels. A female also at seven years of age may be betrothed or given in marriage, at nine is entitled to dower, at twelve is at years of maturity, and therefore may consent or disagree to marriage, and if proved to have sufficient discretion, may bequeath her personal estate. At fourteen is at years of legal discretion, and may choose a guardian, at seventeen may be executrix, and at twenty-one may dispose of herself and her lands. So that full age in male or female is twenty-one years, which age is completed with the day preceding the anniversary of a person's birth, who till that time is an infant, and so styled in law. Among the ancient Greeks and Romans women were never of age, but subject to perpetual guardianship, unless, when married, nisi covenissent in manum viri, and when that perpetual tutelage wore away in process of time, we find that, in females as well as males, full age was not till twenty-five years. Thus, by the constitutions of different kingdoms, this period, which is merely arbitrary, and juris positivi, is fixed at different times. Scotland agrees with England on this point, both probably copying from the old Saxon constitutions on the continent, which extended the age of minority ad annum vesigidum primum, et eo usca juvenis sub tutelum repontant. But in Naples they are of full age at eighteen, in France, with regard to marriage, not till thirty, and in Holland at twenty-five. Third, Infants have various privileges and various disabilities, but their very disabilities are privileges, in order to secure them from hurting themselves by their own improvident acts. An infant cannot be sued, but under the protection, and joining the name, of his guardian, for he is to defend him against all attacks as well by law as otherwise. But he may sue either his guardian or prochain ami, his next friend who is not his guardian. This prochain ami may be any person who will undertake the infant's cause, and it frequently happens that an infant, by his prochain ami, institutes a suit in equity against a fraudulent guardian. In criminal cases, an infant of the age of fourteen years may be capitally punished for any capital offence, but under the age of seven he cannot. The period between seven and fourteen is subject to much uncertainty, for the infant shall, generally speaking, be judged prima facie innocent. Yet if he was doli capax, and could discern between good and evil at the time of the offence committed, he may be convicted and undergo judgment and execution of death, though he hath not attained to years of puberty or discretion. And Sir Matthew Hale gives us two instances, one of a girl of thirteen, who was burned for killing her mistress, another of a boy still younger, that had killed his companion, and hid himself, who was hanged, for it appeared, by his hiding, that he knew he had done wrong, and could discern between good and evil, and in such cases the maxim of law is, that malatia supplet atenum. With regard to estates and civil property, an infant hath many privileges, which will be better understood when we come to treat more particularly of these matters, but this may be said in general, that an infant shall lose nothing by non-claim, or neglect of demanding his right, nor shall any other latches or negligence be imputed to an infant, except in some very particular cases. 
It is generally true that an infant can neither alien his lands, nor do any legal act, nor make a deed, nor indeed any manner of contract that will bind him. But still to all these rules there are some exceptions, part of which were just now mentioned in reckoning up the different capacities which they assume at different ages, and there are others, a few of which it may not be improper to recite, as a general specimen of the whole. And first it is true that infants cannot alien their estates, but infant trustees or mortgagees are able to convey, under the direction of the court of chancery or exchequer, the estates they hold in trust or mortgage, to such persons as the court shall appoint. Also it is generally true that an infant can do no legal act, yet an infant who has an avowson may present to the benefice when it becomes void. For the law in this case dispenses with one rule in order to maintain others of far greater consequence. It permits an infant to present a clerk, who, if unfit, may be rejected by the bishop, rather than either suffer the church to be unserved till he comes of age, or permit the infant to be debarred of his right by lapse to the bishop. An infant may also purchase lands, but his purchase is incomplete, for when he comes of age, he may either agree or disagree to it, as he thinks prudent or proper, without alleging any reason, and so may his heirs after him, if he dies without having completed his agreement." It is farther generally true that an infant under twenty-one can make no deed that is of any force or effect, yet he may bind himself apprentice by deed indented, or indentures, for seven years, and he may by deed or will appoint a guardian to his children if he has any. Lastly, it is generally true that an infant can make no other contract that will bind him, yet he may bind himself to pay for his necessary meat, drink, apparel, physic, and other such necessaries, and likewise for his good teaching and instruction whereby he may profit himself afterwards. And thus much at present for the privileges and disabilities of infants. End of section 46